right? No? No. Yes, it does. It's quite kind of important because this is the one of the first sessions I do that there are actually more people online than live here. So welcome, fellow .NET developers, or at least I'm assuming. Um, it would be nice if my slides would be on the screen. Well, I'll start with the who am I? Uh, my name is Eva Kramer. And, uh, ah, see, there is my picture. Um, I work for Fireleaf, and I'm not just hosting dev days for, for you know for my for my job, but I'm actually a software developer, and I work on the .NET SDK. I'm not the only one. We're a team of three at Fireleaf, working on the open source uh, .NET SDK. And what I want to talk about today is what we've done for SDK five. It is a big change. Maybe we, we try not to make even the major new versions um, painful to, to switch to, but it doesn't mean that, that, there didn't, that, that, that there's not a lot of stuff that happened because there, we did actually do a big restructuring of the SDK uh, for SDK 5. And the reason that we did that is that the number, the number of five versions got a little bit out of hand. Uh, when we started out with DS2.1 and DS2.2, uh, we figured, and, and actually we weren't the only ones, just everyone working on Fire back then thought that when we were going from SU2 to 3, we would just drop uh, DS2.2. But that was, of course, not true, because by the time SU3 was there, DS2.2 was just getting started to get used. So there was no way we could sunset DS2.2 or DS2.1. yeah. This one. This one. Uh, this one. Uh, this one. Uh, I guess this one, right? This is. Okay. We keep on making this mistake. Well, there was nothing interesting to see if you're online so far, so that's good. Um, now it works. So, uh, too many versions error was basically the problem. And um, it didn't get any better. So we said to each other, you know what, we'll support two versions. So by the time the next version is there, or we'll phase out these two too. Obviously that didn't work. And it gets even worse because by the time our, our three and our four are in actual use, people start working on our five, right? So you have to have our five as well. So by then we had copies of the SDK and branches for the ST2, ST3, R4 and R5, which meant that the poor maintainers, whenever they published a new version, uh, first off, we had to ask all maintainers and everyone who wanted to cooperate with us, with us to make the changes in the oldest version that we still maintain, say SU3, uh, so not on the newest one. And then we had to copy and paste everything forward from version to version. It's actually a miracle now I talk about it that we managed to keep that doing for about six or seven years. Uh, but publishing a new version of the SDK became a, a one to two day experience, which is unmaintainable. Uh, and then you hear the, the people at Facebook and everywhere saying, oh, we can do this in one hour. And we're like, nah, we can't. Uh, and to add to the pain, we published R4B. No one uses it, but we had to add another version to our thing. And of course, we're now working on R6. So the only thing we really managed to drop was the issue to Otherwise, we're still maintaining all these versions. That had to change. And this was somewhere September last year that we looked in each other's eyes and say, no more of this. Um, we, need, we need a better strategy. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to tell you what we did. And if you could say, like, this is all internal, but we learned a lot about working with multiple versions of Fire and how to solve these problems. So I, I, I do like to um, share the, my experience with, with doing this. So maybe that is very useful for your own projects if you have to support multiple projects, uh, use, sorry, for multiple versions of Fire. So I'll give you a little bit more details about that. And you'll understand where we're going. Um, how to use this new SDK, it's hopefully simpler, at least it is for us. And um, as I said, it might help you on your own multi-version fire projects. 
uh, about four years ago, we already noticed that um, our SDK actually consisted of a lot of stuff that was different from from the version to version. But if you'd look from STU3 onward, there was actually quite a bit that we could reuse across the projects, like the data types. They didn't change a lot. Um, we, we had uh, we did an interview yesterday with with uh, Lloyd and Graham and me on the history of fire. And one thing that we were proud of was the fact that Graham designed these data types and they didn't change a lot. So that was a good initial design. It was good for us too. So we, we actually split those off a while ago, just like Firepath, uh, the serializers and some stuff into a second repo. And so we had at least one repo with the shared things across all versions. And then of course, for every uh, version of Fire, a, a separate uh, branch in another repo. So we had the file in that SDK and file in that common. So we had to learn how to work with modules and submodules in Git, which was a learning experience. I don't know if I'm going to do it again. Uh, if you ever just reach out to me and I'll tell you the pains and the um, um, of doing it. And one thing is that you have to sync the PRs, right? If you change something that unfortunately touches both the common stuff and the thing in a specific version of Fire, your pull request reviewers have to make sure that they pull both at the same time. Otherwise, you have a build that doesn't even run. And that's painful coordinating that. Um, com still cumbersome to release, like everything sync, copy paste, and, and, uh, and all that stuff. We had to forward and merge the changes from S2.3 to 4. As I said, our committers sometimes committed in R4 branch. They really should have in STU3 because we only had a process for bringing stuff forward. A mess. And working with submodules really hard. So 90% of our PRs were on the incorrect branch. Um, so we had to do something. So why in the first place did we copy and paste? Well, so it was naivety, thinking that stuff would go away. So we could just copy it and then let the other thing die. But also, um, for example, if you build a snapshot generator and the snapshot generator is built on top of structure definition and structure definition really differs from SU three to four and very much from two. So because we had a structure definition specific to a fire version, the snapshot generators and on top of that, the validators, everything depends on those specific versions. So we had no other choice than to copy and paste that code or that's what we thought. Um, and then, of course, there's parts of the uh, SDK that simply depend on metadata, like the parsers. They need to know which classes to deserialize to. So if you want to say deserialize or not deserialize, the deserializer has to know I'm an, I have to deserialize into R4. Um, and, and so you have to uh, build a hard, there was a hard link between the deserializers and, and the version of Fire that we used. So all in all, a lot of copy and paste. Luckily, we were forced to think about a solution, otherwise we would have just gone on. So what we did we do? Okay, problem one. Let's let's now break this up in two things. So we have code that could be common if only we could say, dear serializer, use this, use this set of classes and deserialize into that, because then that deserialization code could be um, in base. And we managed to do that. And so, but problem one was these POCO dependencies. So having code um, um, depend on classes that are just in R4, R3, R5. And so you have to copy and paste that code. So the first thing we did is try to push as many of the fire resources and data types into a base set that we could use from R3 all the way to R5 and R6. And we managed to get that done. So those were a resource that helped quite a lot. Having resource uh, in, in a base library, that was really good. Uh, all the data types and their subclasses, operation outcome, value set parameters, bundle and binary. Uh, actually bundle, we, did, we only managed at the last moment, uh, but we managed in R5 to get all these things or in, in, our, in the release five of the SDK, we managed to get all these things in a base set. And that helped a lot because all code then, for example, all terminology code based on value set, we could at least reuse. And, um, but painfully enough, there's things that we, we couldn't get uh, done across versions like structure definition and element definition code system capability statement, uh, they are too hard to be shared, which means that we still have like the validator and the snapshot generator, which are based on 
R4 structure definition, R5 structure definition, SGO3, we still had to kind of, we thought, copy and paste that code. But it was already much better to have this set of classes uh, over to a set of base that we could reuse. Uh, so how did we do that? Because there are differences. If you if you you know if you've worked with these things before, um, this is if you can't read this, this is binary, and binary has uh, binary from our three to our four. I think uh, is that true? Yeah, since our four. So until our four. Um, it was called the, the binary content of binary was called content, and then from R4 it was called data. Um, so how on earth are we going to share that? So so it is like this greatest common denominator. We're like, okay, then we'll make a class binary which has both, and um, we will mark in the metadata here because we have the metadata here in attributes. We will mark this element as saying this is actually since R4. And also in the comments on top of the element, we generated, no, this element was introduced in R4, so do not use this when working in all the releases. Now I'm waiting for someone in the community to say, I'll write a Roslyn uh, compiler extension so we can actually catch this as comp at compile time, because of course now, um, if you don't read the IntelliSense, uh, you could still choose the wrong element. But we, we figured that this was still worth doing because sharing binary brought so much advantages that the disadvantages of someone using the wrong element um, would outweigh uh, the problems. So now if you do the wrong thing, by the time you serialize or parse it, the parser will say, I'm running in an R3 context and I, I have no idea what data is. So you, you will get warned, but that's at runtime, right? So a Roslyn compiler extension would be nice. But using these kind of sins things here, that's this attribute in, in the metadata, helped us to at least erase away quite a few of the changes. I have another example here. This is bundle. Uh, so this is another kind of change where the relation element used to be a string, and in R5, it's now a code. Uh, and, and so we have a declare type metadata attribute. We've had that since ages, but it also has this since attribute. So at, at least at this, um, in this way, we had a formal uh, way of at least knowing still which, which was in R5 and R4. And the validators and the parser still enforce that. So that since attribute is really important. But then there are resources that are so much different and we really like to share them, but we can't. Uh, and for a long time, we had no solution for those. And we were like, okay, we'll just have to keep copying and pasting them. So we have an ST3 version, four, five, four B, six, six, one, six, two, who knows what's coming, five C. Um, and we were a little bit nervous about that. And, uh, but we thought there was no other solution because they were too different. But then again, if you really think about it, and it's actually a miracle it took us so long. And sometimes you have these problems, you're discussing that with your colleague, and I, why didn't we think about this before? Um, but if I put this in a table, yeah, here we go, then where were we at this point? Everything in the original comment, so everything that we already had in that separate repo, we were able to put in this new base layer of shared like SU3 and later stuff. And we were using these synths and uh, these attributes, we're able to put operation outcome and so on also in base. But then you have structure definition, element definition, all that stuff that we were unable to share. Now, maybe this is because you're always trying for a solution where it either, if it doesn't work for everything, then it's not good enough. We don't do it. And then we realized, no, what we could do, um, sorry, yeah. Here, that's the slide, and is actually have then two copies instead of eight, right? So it turned out that structure definition, element definition, code system, it was really different from SU3 to R4, but from R4 on, not so much changed. So instead of throwing the child with the bathwater, I don't know if that's an expression in any other language in Dutch, let's say it doesn't work, so up, we don't do it. We say, okay, we'll have two copies instead. So there is now in R5 an STU3 copy of structure definition and element definition, and there is a R4 and later version. So that, you know, it at least decreases the pain. We only have two structure definitions in the SDK at the moment.
it's that's the kind of thing that's simple once you see it in in its life. But like it took us ages to figure this out, and um, uh, so this means that we have a base and we have a thing called conformance, which has all the R four plus stuff in it. All right. Another thing we needed to fix, we wanted one repo done with the submodules. And uh, that meant that we made, that we, that we took the repo we already had, and instead of having a develop SU3, uh, SU4, R5, R6, just one branch called develop, yoo-hoo, and um, make one big solution with um, all the projects in it that we had. Um, and actually, really have one project. So we now have a project called hl7.fire.base. And that includes all the old namespaces and the stuff that we can share. So that's just one project, one assembly, and it has the parsers, the serializers, Firepath, uh, the data types, everything in base, one project. Um, so bundle operation outcome, that are, those are the resources that we, as I showed you, were managed to get across all the versions. And then of course we have the R4 plus things, and that's the library called Conver Conformance, also known as R4 plus. So there's a second project called hl7.fire.conformance, and that contains everything needed to run R4 and later. So if you're on R3, you can, you can go by with just getting hl7.fire.base, uh, for the shared classes, and if you're doing R4, then uh, you need this. You need this one, and then obviously there are resources that are completely different. I mean, R5 has medication, blah blah blah. All these all these resources that are new, uh, and, and even patient, and all those those things. Those are still in separate SU3, R4, R4B, R5 project. Um, and so that means that there is, as I said, there is still for structure definition, both a copy in uh, HL7.5 conformance for R4 plus, and there is a copy of structure definition in STU3. Uh, but R4, R4B, R4, R5, those projects don't have copies of those anymore. They simply depend on HL7.5 conformance. So uh, this means that that at any moment when I'm working on fire, there's just three, pro three projects for me in scope, which is the version that I'm working on, conformance and base, and in one repo. Um, I must say that the first time we were doing PRs on our own repo, it felt like, it, it, is this the only thing we need to do? It is so good to just do a pull request on a single branch again, and it was, it was a delight. It took us about, uh, eight weeks to get this whole restructuring done. So it's quite a bit of work, but after we, uh, we're, 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 we're quickly gaining time again. Now we've, now we've done this. Um, so I encounter measure medication, all that stuff is still, still in the, in the, in those, um, uh, projects. Now for NuGet packages, what does it look like? We'll now have a hl7.fire.base NuGet. There is an hl7.fire conformance uh, NuGet that you don't need if you're doing SU3, but if you're doing R4+, plus. and, and uh, then there is uh, one uh, uh, NuGet per version of Fire. What we also did is, and that was a, that was a very a, a long-standing request, is take out this big spec.zip that, co that contained the whole specification, because not everyone needs that. The spec.zip uh, was was from times before we distributed the fire specification as npm files, and everyone is used to it. There's no way we could do away with that. I mean, there are some changes we could make in a major release uh, that would cause people to have to do some work. But throwing away spec.zip was going to cause so much pain that we kept it around. But we put it now in a separate NuGet package. So there is now a specification of data dot. SU3, R4, and so on, that just contains one thing, and that's the spec.zip. So if you don't need that, you don't need to fetch that NuGet anymore, which saves you um, um, disk space mostly. And it does matter if you deploy this stuff in a lot of containers everywhere. So um, for backwards compatibility, we pull the trick that Microsoft taught us, and that is, how are we going to make sure um, that if people in their projects have a reference to a NuGet called hl7.specification.stu3, that it will still 
fetch these two things. And we did that with meta packages, which you might have heard about, but it's basically a package without new code. It has just references. So we published this empty package called hl7.specification that has to three that does nothing but refer to these two new uh, these two new ones. So everyone who has an old project referencing to this will just get both of these new satellites. And we did the same thing with the other versions. So um, uh, if, if you have a reference to R4, uh, as you had, because it, that didn't change, nothing changed, if you had the specification and so on, you'll actually get an empty meta package. So now you know you could update your csproj files to actually reference the, the, the non-empty NuGet, so to say. Um, uh, this allowed us to to make you know to keep our uh, to keep our users happy and you know because we we would like for everyone even at major changes to basically do control build and it builds without problems. So sometimes it doesn't work, but in this case we could we could ease the pain. Um, that's not all. Oh yeah, so these specific libraries we call satellites internally. So you, you'll hear this this term. Those are the satellite DLL. So we have Bayesian conformance and the satellite DLL. So those are the, the, the version specific DLL still. Also what we did is remove the validator from uh, the SDK. Well, remove is a big word because you're still using it. Um, so we, uh, we isolated that in a different project and those are now in NuGet packages called legacy.validation.su3, um, which is an interesting thing. By the time we were doing this change, we were completely convinced that in the version SDK 5 timeframe, we would be able to include our new validator. Well, we didn't have time for it. So we're now in a weird situation where um, there is a legacy dot validation, but the actual validator isn't there yet. So sorry about that. Um, someone said, well, did you talk about marketing about that one? No, no, really, it's that, that, it doesn't look pretty, but it's just software reality, right? So the validator is still there. It's called legacy.validation.su3. And soon enough, we'll have the new validator. Uh, we're working on that on the next sprint. So at least there's not only legacy, but also a new validator. Also part of the SDK, maybe less well-known, but very useful still, is Filey.Fire.Packages, which is a NuGet that allows you to use NPMs instead of the spec.zip that you used to do. So uh, most of, or actually all of the things that depend on structure definitions use the, an interface called uh, iResource Resolver. And Filey.Fire.Packages contains an iResource Resolver that uses NPM files instead of spec.zip. So this is also your chance to finally move from uh, the zip files to using uh, the, the NPM files. There's a Fire.Metrics NuGet uh, that implements UCOM which is really useful if you have to implement Firepath on quantities. It can compare you know, grams to kilograms and, and, and all that stuff, normalize units. So that is uh, useful if you're building a server because I know that our searches in Fire really requires you to uh, have knowledge of the UCOM units. So that's Fire.Metrics. And you probably have heard of the fact that we are working on hl7.cql uh, together with ngqa to have a uh, CQL engine uh, working with the Filey SDK. And um, we are going to maintain that library uh, together with NCQA. I'm pretty sure tomorrow there will be sessions on that by uh, Evan Matrusak. He will talk about what he's done. Actually, this was the previous week in our Filey offices here in Amsterdam. We worked like madmans getting uh, HL7.CQL working on um, on the SDK. The fact that I'm using squirrely, squirrely lines is, is that we're not done yet. Right, so I know I'm not I'm not sure whether we're ready to publish it, but uh, there will be an alpha version soon for you to play with uh, CQL in the .NET space, which I think is is great. Uh, then a small thing about yeah, even less copy and paste. So I was saying copy and pasting was a thing we did, uh, and uh, then we discovered that well. So let's take this bit of code as an example. This is uh, a thing that we copied across all versions originally. So we have an extension method called off type, um, which has and why can't we share this in base? 
not because of element definition, because that is in conformance, so that at least we should have been able to put this in conformance, but there is this nasty idiom called fire all types, which is different in every single version of fire, which meant that we had no other choice, we thought, than copying this code. And then we discovered a 14-year-old feature of Visual Studio was called shared projects. Who had heard of shared projects? One, two, three, right. Well, we sh you should learn about this, my goodness. Um, you can see that the icon is different and that is because this project doesn't actually compile into an assembly. When you reference this project from R4, R4B, R5, and so on, logically at least, when you build, everything in the shared project will be copied into that project, right? So now we only needed at least one copy of this file containing of type. And just before the build, Visual Studio would copy this, this code over to all the other projects and, and, and then build it. So in the end, of course, you'll have an R4, R5, and R4B version of this extension method, but at least we have one copy of the code, which makes our life much, much easier. So all this stuff is in shims.r4 and up and so on. And um, I just wanted to point you this out. This was like an eye opener for us uh, maintaining a multi-version uh, uh, code base. And then we have code that relied on metadata. That was our second problem, right? Deserializers. Yeah, to which version of Fire? Where do I want to deserialize? It's not that the deserializers or the validator couldn't run without being bound to a specific version of Fire, but which version of Fire? And uh, for a long time already, uh, so this is a bit of code that, you know, you just want to say new Fire XML parser, uh, but then no, which model classes to deserialize into? Uh, for a long time, we had something called the model inspector. And the model inspector was, is, a, is a class in the .NET SDK that is basically a cache on reflection. So all these attributes that I show you that are on the model, they're all reflected at startup time and cached into the model inspector. And so we fixed this problem now with a solution pattern called common something. So we now have a common fire JSON serializer that takes as a parameter the model inspector, which actually represents the metadata of a certain version of fire. Uh, and then that's in base. And then in each of the satellites, we have a very simple shim that is called, you know, that, that has the, still the old name. So fire JSON serializer. So people can just new up a fire JSON serializer. It's a really thin shim. And in fact, the only thing that it does is call its base with model info, the model inspector. And model info is a class present in every satellite assembly. So for R4, R5, and so on, that, calls, that contains the model metadata for that version. So this way, if you don't want to know about this stuff, you can still use and, and, and believe that, that there's nothing going on, new fire JSON serializer, but actually uh, what happens is that you're newing up a common fire JSON serializer uh, initialized with the right model. So in this way, this we, we put this in base and this in satellite. So if you're writing software that works across several versions, you'd better off using this common thing and then just at construction time, um, give it the right version of the model. And we did that uh, on many classes. Um, so the serializers, common serializers, web resolver, common web resolver, blah, 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 and so on, and so on. Ooh, who's doing that? Okay, anyway, um, uh, we didn't follow the pattern everywhere because there were already sometimes these kind of classes. So we have fire client, base fire client, uh, fire JSON, base fire JSON. And so that's why I put this table here. Um, and in fact, the package library that I showed you, uh, we didn't even go the way here. The, the fire package source which reached the NPMs just has this base thing. So you'll have to supply it, uh, the mole info. And then obviously there are the classes in the satellite where we couldn't yet do this trick. The snapshot generator depends on an, a, a specific version of structure definition. And structure definition is too different across all versions that we uh, could make this trick work unfortunately, because there's a lot of code. So model inspector, as I said, it's a cache of the fire.net attributes. Um, it has all the reflection data. So that means that for every class it finds in the assemblies that is a fire class, it, it reads in a class mapping. Every class, it has property mappings which represents the fire properties uh, from the resources. Uh, since 5.3, which you can't download yet, there is new also, there's now also an enum mapping. So you can ask 
um, give me a value, this value, give me the enum for this value set, or rather, I have here the administrative gender enum, what is the value set URL for it, and so on. All this metadata is in the model inspector. It understands this since attribute, so you'll have a model inspector for R3, R4, R5, and so on. How do you find it? Well, I did show you, that's crap. Um, so there is uh, the easy way, if you have, a, if you are, for, for example, with an external alias, you have loaded up uh, all versions, you can, you can actually do HL7 dot, or whatever your alias model, uh, HL7 dot fire dot model dot model info, model inspector for a certain version, or more dynamically, you can do model inspector dot for assembly and then passing in it an assembly uh, where the patient classes, for example, and it will it will then load uh, all the dependent classes. And um, for some reason, this is really hard to read. Well, then, as, as I showed you, you can pass these into the constructors, or even so, for example, here, the new uh, JSON deserializer dot for fire model inspector and so on, or the alternative JSON serializer for fire and then, then passing it in type of patient assembly. So this way we were able to um, reuse the serializers, the directory source, the common source, all those classes in the table, we were able to put all that stuff into base with a really thin shim uh, in these satellite assemblies. M even more code disappeared that way. Um, oh yeah, that's right. That's a good reminder. Sometimes reality uh, it, uh, while writing this presentation, I discovered that model inspector dot for assembly doesn't really work correctly. So we'll, I'm fixing that for the 5.3 release. Great. It's nice. I have a bit of time for this extra uh, because also introduced has nothing to do with shared code is um, I also discovered while doing this, or we discovered that most of the time, the fact that you need this separation between a shim and a base class is because you need the model inspector, as I showed you. But in many cases, the reason you need the model inspector is because um, what you really need is the serialization engine, right? The fire client doesn't need metadata about the model, but it does need to be able to deserialize the HTML that's, or the, the, uh, the, the, the XML or the JSON that's coming in over TCP IP. And the same is true for the package deserializers or for package sources for a lot of our classes. It's not that we really depend on the metadata, but we depend on a serialization engine for a specific version of fire. So we figured, why don't we make pluggable serializers for these classes? So I started doing that for the Fire Client. So the Fire Client actually has a setting called iFire Serialization Engine, which allows you to plug in your own serialization engine. Because what we've done originally is that in many places in the SDK, I just knew up a new serializer somewhere deep down the code. So you have no control over setting settings on the serializer or whatever. So an old problem was that if you used the fire client and you, you contacted with a server that, that had mistakes in the XML or JSON or it used another version, there was nothing you could do about it because we hard coded this deserialization logic into the fire client. That's no longer the case. There is now this iFire serialization interface that um, that you can plug. And that finally solves, and we've discussed this problem so many times at the work group meetings, uh, how can we configure a deserializer to be a little bit more lenient or more strict if we want to? Uh, um, and so now you can do stuff like fire client with strict serializer, give me errors for every single thing you know about with lenient serializer, which means as long as there's no data loss, ignore the errors with backwards compatible serializer, which means allow unknown enums, uh, allow unknown uh, properties on uh, resources. And then finally, we have the ostrich serializer. I don't care about the errors. Just give me whatever you can parse from the resource. Uh, and you can obviously write your own fire serialization engine as well. Um, I did include a code here for if you download it, it's, it's it's actually pretty. Um, it also shows you that our new um, 
system dot text dot json based deserializers and XML deserializers now have a method called try deserialize resource. So that means that they will go on deserializing, trying to get as much data as they can out of the instance, and then output a list of errors. So what we that's how we created all these different flavors of the deserializer now is that we just have a list of things that we so for example the fire json exception is a method whether an issue is recoverable. So I'm just inspecting this list of issues whether these issues are you know we I can allow them or not and then depending on that decide on whether I'm actually going to throw an ex a, de a deserialization exception or not. So now you have full control over um over what you want to allow uh, for deserialization. And I have minus one minute. So uh, plans for 2023, obviously publish a new non-legacy validator. I'd already talked about that. Um, integrate with the new NCQA CQL engine. We hope to get that stuff finished before the September workgroup meeting. Um, and now move structure definition and friends. No, not into base. That would be crazy. Uh, but I, I uh, yeah, well, into base actually. We have it in conformance, uh, so we we can reuse it across R four plus. But we think now we know. Now we know how to use all these since attributes that maybe we can get structure definition into base. So that means that we have structure definition across all versions, and we can have a single validator, a single snapshot generator, and all that stuff. But that's going to be a lot of work, but it's still a plan for 2023, obviously the 6.0 release. Um, that's it. I have um, links here in the presentation for more information, specifically about all the breaking changes in five. We always, on the FileNet SDK, in the wiki, have breaking changes uh, uh pages we maintain them while making the breaking changes um there is a separate uh in the wiki of the, the sdk a separate post about all these structural changes that i've been talking about and then there the i actually documented the pluggable serialization feature in fire client already so if you go to docs.firely for the net sdk um there is actually a section on uh selecting a serializer and that means we have a nice amount of time for questions. Hi, very interesting to see how you restructured everything. Um, I'm curious about the the options you didn't choose for this, because um, I, I hear this problem. The first thing that pops into, pops into my mind is if devs everywhere, but obviously you didn't choose that. Did, is it something you... Uh, uh thought about if devs uh or was it just uh, yeah so devs? so originally we didn't need if devs uh because of the way because we copied everything right it, when it was ds2 two time uh, it was so and ds2 one ds2 three was so many different that we didn't even consider if devs or anything and by the time our four came we were so much in copy mode that we didn't do it um now we have a few so in this shared code bit uh, sometimes we do need an if dev because we can't we, we really want this shared project thing but yeah there are slight changes between the versions so there's there are a little bit if devs now uh, but we didn't really need them in base at all uh, and not in conformance so they're 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 pretty minimal yeah better to have, not to have them because yeah it's, it's, an older it's better not to have them right because you need you we do test the deserializer diligently across all versions because of the if devs we have to right yeah Any other questions? Other questions online? Because there's there's more audience online than there's here, so. We can Could check be. Kuva here. Don't see any online currently. You can also post me questions about other stuff. Like I know something about the SDK, so if you have any other questions. Oh. I mean, I have one, but, ah, Peter? Oh yeah, or, or, Thanks, Hayward. That was brilliant. Really brilliant. Um, I'm just wondering, in view of the, the discussion on version yesterday, do you think this is all leading um, us with server implementations to to have single endpoints that can hold, handle multiple versions of Fire? Um, so this will help. Uh, this will certainly help at uh, at this at this moment to have multiple endpoints for R3 or four four and R5, but. Uh, I think in the end, I hope you'd only need uh, 
But that's a promise. Like we only need the latest R6 uh, version of the SDK to be able to read R5, R4, and R and R4 stuff or something. Or at least we need the latest, say R7, to be able to read R6 and R5 things. So you don't you you wouldn't actually uh, need multiple endpoints. It, the whole multiple endpoints discussion is really interesting because, as I said yesterday, um, during some session, is that we have been trained to think that the differences between the releases are so big that we really need multiple endpoints. But if you are use, if you're building an app that uses a, a blood pressure observation that basically didn't change since R3, right? So, so it would be a waste for our fire client to say, oh, I, I, I am R, R4, right? And this is an R5 server. I can't read that simple observation. Uh, so already we have in, a, a new setting in the fire client now where you can say, don't do this version check. I am taking the risks, right? I want to talk to this whatever version uh, of, of, this, of this server and I'll, I'll deal with the differences because I know that my, my needs for observation as a client are so simple that I don't care. Uh, and I and I and um, but that's a whole process we all have to go through, uh, and maybe that means in the end that the, the whole multiple. So the fact that you have an endpoint for a specific release of fire, I hope that will over the years slowly that necessities will slowly disappear. But until that time, we need this stuff, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, it, it is. We are already you know stepping for. That's why we call. That's why in the end we call this stuff conformance, not R4 plus, because we believe that in the end, you just need a conformance in the base library, right? That's, 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 that's the end goal. And maybe at, at some moment, we have base conformance and satellite, and that's the only thing you have to worry about. Okay, any other questions? Great, thank you, Avat. You're welcome. Yep. And I'll be around, right? But that's yeah. You know, you know where to find me.